Good afternoon. Welcome to Happy Hour on the Prairie. My name is Felicia. I am the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. And I'm all ready with my favorite prairie related beverage. It's a new one called Daydreaming uh, from the very fitting Perennial Artisan Ales, my favorite brewery. It's here in St. Louis. Um, of course, it's hot today, so I have my sunglasses and my favorite floppy hat on too. Thank you for joining us for the next webinar series in July. Uh, today and next week, we are going to have virtual tours of select MPF prairies. And the following July Wednesdays, we will hear from authors Margot Farnsworth and Ellen Branhagen about their new books coming out. Uh, we are happy to have the opportunity to bring you these webinars and to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Grow Native program in 2020. Uh, today, we will be hearing from MPF, MPF Director of Prairie Management, Jared Huebner, and MPF Vice President of Science and Management, Bruce Schutte, as they give us a virtual tour of Snowball Hill Prairie, Friendly Prairie, and Drover's Prairies. Uh, please make sure to use the chat feature to ask any questions of Jared and Bruce, and at the end of their presentation, I will read those questions to them. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Jared and Bruce. Well, afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to Snowball Hill Prairie. I hope everybody's prepared for the heat out there and and has your sun and have your sunscreen all good and splashed on you. Um, in a minute, we're going to start up the the hill and snowball and snowball hill. Um, here's um, one of the signs you'll see when you get to the prairie to welcome you there. And uh, from the sign, we just go ahead and we can start uh, trudging on up uh, to the top of Snowball Hill. Uh, Snowball Hill is a, a very unique site. Uh, Prairie Foundation acquired it with the help of the Platt Land Trust and uh, others in 2015. Um, it's proven to be just an exquisite little prairie. Uh, the prairie part itself is only about 22 acres, but it's just packed with um, uh, a number of uh, very high quality uh, prairie plants. So it's a, a very diverse site. Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting about Snowball Hill is uh, the name, and uh, that's what it's been called for years. I guess there's sort of two local stories on how Snowball Hill got its name. Uh, one is because of the abundance in some years of uh, the bunch flower. And uh, some years it uh, actually almost seems to turn part of the prairie white. So there was one idea that maybe that's where the prairie got its name, although it was also a very well-known spot for sleigh riding and that kind of thing during the winter. And so, you know, very likely that's how it, it um, actually got the name Snowball Hill. But it's a very unique site. It is kind of a prominent uh, hill that uh, sticks up. And because of that, uh, there's actually sort of several types of prairie there and an interesting uh, moisture regime that gives it a lot of diversity. So up on top of the hill um, is a much drier prairie and um, it's uh, got a limestone bedrock that it formed in. And so you get a number of kind of unique plants up there in this limestone part of the prairie, um, like this ground plum and the hairy parsley. Uh, both are very high quality prairie plants. And if any of you have listened to the other seminars or talks where we talked about the coefficient of conservatism, a zero to 10 scale ranking plants by like how restricted they are to native habitats, uh, things that are like nines and tens are very much restricted to a high quality native habitat. And that's what these plants are. So the idea of conservative species is one of the things that helps tell us a story about what the history of the prairie has been like and indicate to us the quality of it. The plant on the right is uh, actually a little fern, an adder's tongue fern, um, a very unique little fern, mostly just grows in the spring before it gets too dry. And then the little plant kind of shrivels up and disappears. 
But uh, this one also is characteristic of areas where there's limestone soils, like limestone glades and in prairies, if, if they have enough of the limestone influence. So some of the unique things found right up on the hilltop. But then as you go down the side of the hill, uh, you encounter prairies that are a little bit moister. And in some areas, there's almost like kind of seasonally seepy areas in that. So this gradient of moisture from dry to pretty wet uh, accounts for a lot of the, the diversity of what we can find in Snowball Hill. So just to go through and take a look at a few of the plants, kind of especially starting out with some of them you might see in the spring or earlier in the season. <clears throat> and then moving to ones that you see during the summer and, and later on. Um, this little yellow member of the lily family is called yellow star grass. Uh, the leaves are kind of grass-like, but it is actually a lily and, and not a type of grass at all. And as we go on, uh, there's a number of characteristic uh, prairie plants. This is cream wild indigo one of a couple species of wild indigo found on Snowball Hill Prairie, uh, getting its name not because of the color of the flowers, but uh, these plants used to be used as a source of dye. And it was kind of a blue color dye that uh, could be obtained from these plants. And hence, that's why this group of plants are called wild indigos, even though our most common ones are cream or white in color. There's prairie phlox, um, uh, another good high quality prairie species, uh, can be quite abundant at times and they really come in a kind of a variety of colors there from very pale to some that are, are really quite uh, deep pink in color. As we move a little bit later into spring, uh, there's things like um, the finger coreopsis and uh, sensitive briar like you see on the left. On the right is um, one of the beard tongues. And then pale, pur pale purple cone flowers are also quite common here at Snowball Hill. As we continue to kind of move down into a little bit of the wetter areas, uh, the bunch flower I mentioned uh, before is a very high quality plant, a pretty uncommon one that uh, at least in some years after the burns can be quite abundant on the, on the lower slopes. Now, never as abundant as the bunch flower, but sometimes mixed in, uh, Michigan lilies are also found in the prairie. Um, obviously one of our most beautiful native wild lilies. Again, going through a number of pretty characteristic prairie plants. Uh, there's butterfly weed and a uh, lead plant, which actually is considered uh, a small shrub or a woody plant, but lead plant is one of the most uh, characteristic plants of our native prairies. We also have New Jersey tea mixed into the mixed in with the lead plant, like you can see here. But the New Jersey tea is actually another uh, native shrub, actually considered kind of a woody plant. Uh, also, of some historical significance because <clears throat> this plant on the East Coast was used to make a tea uh, as a substitute for <clears throat> imported teas and was one of the plants that the colonists turned to after the Boston Tea Party when um, other teas, imported teas were cut off, they would turn to the native plants that could be used to make tea like this New Jersey tea. And interestingly enough at uh, Snowball Hill Prairie, uh, we do have a second um, kind of New Jersey tea, a close relative called red root. And so in this case, both species of New Jersey tea <clears throat> are found growing pretty much intermixed on, uh, on the slope. There's the white wild indigo and a uh, very important grass to at least uh, some of the uh, animals that live on Snowball Hill. This is the Eastern Gamma grass, which blooms um, much earlier in the year than most of the, the prairie grasses, but it's quite abundant there. Uh, as we move a little bit later into the summer and um, start looking at some of the animals too, uh, 
golden garden spiders or black and yellow argiopes are a very uh, uh, common type of spider out there. While spiders, like many of the animals, are not totally restricted to prairies, they mostly just like open grasslands, but nevertheless, they are a very uh, uh, important characteristic species of the prairie. And as we move a little bit later in the year, we get things like the rough white lettuce and sawtooth sunflower uh, down in the wetter areas near the bottom. And then uh, later come golden rods like the showy golden rod. Um, one of the more uh, remnant restricted golden rods we have in Missouri, uh, one of the conservative species, it's a real good indicator. And then blue sage also occurs there. Now, uh, with this amount of floral resources, as you can imagine, there's a lot of fauna that take advantage of it too. Um, and um, very fortunately for us, there's a group of people in the Kansas City area, um, a local group called the Idalia Society, which have for several years been conducting uh, bird and butterfly counts on Snowball Hill Prairie. So this has helped give us some great information on the kind of butterflies as well as birds and, and that that are using the prairie. Uh, they have found a, made a couple very interesting finds. One is this little gemmed satyr, um, a butterfly I think more characteristic of very southwestern Missouri. So it was kind of surprising to find it up at Snowball Hill. And then um, while they're doing their surveys, uh, also recording caterpillars they see as well as the adult butterflies. But one of their um, uh, very important discoveries is there seems to be a very healthy population of the golden bison skipper. And the golden bison skipper, it's not actually considered rare in Missouri, but it is very uncommon. And it's considered to be a real prairie specialist as far as butterflies go. So having a, a very healthy population of them on this prairie is, uh, is very notable. Oh. And I might also mention that the bison skipper, the caterpillars, only feed on prairie grasses, and especially that eastern gamma grass that we mentioned before. So that eastern gamma grass population at the prairie is on the prairie is one of the things that helps support this population of a real prairie specialist butterfly. Now there's also uh, other animals represented. Uh, we know for sure that there are prairie king snakes there, a beautiful snake. Um, again, not restricted to prairies. They like open areas, but they're also very much a part of the prairie natural community. And so these are just beautiful, harmless snakes and very beneficial because they're uh, very good mousers. And then, even though Snowball Hill is pretty small in size, the prairie itself is only 22 acres, but um, we do have a number of grassland birds that do use this prairie also. Uh, birds like this Dixissel and Eastern Meadowlarks um, show up uh, frequently on the, on the bird counts. And so, um, so even, even with its limited size, grassland birds do definitely uh, depend on, on this prairie. And then as we get into the <clears throat> kind of into the fall, some of the characteristic latest bloomers of the prairie would be things like the rough blazing star, uh, the rigid golden rod. Um, these are both found on that drier part of the prairie up on the hilltop. Uh, there's uh, the showy golden rod and several different kinds of asters. And then there are, there is a population of the downy gentian there too. And this is another one of those very conservative, uh, very prairie restricted or habitat restricted um, wildflowers and uh, oftentimes kind of a favorite for prairie enthusiasts, especially in the fall when most of the other uh, plants are done blooming uh, is to find this downy gentian. Now to maintain this uh, 
wonderful prairie. Um, we have uh, been instituting a lot of management under the very skilled auspices of our uh, director of prairie management, Jared Hudner, and Jared will go through a little bit on some of the management that's been taking place on Snowball Hill. So just kind of highlighting some of this, those of you that have been out there the last few years have, have really seen some pretty big changes. Um, but just kind of sticking to these slides, we, we prefer to burn only one half to one third of the prairie, somewhere in that range in a given season. Um, like I said, if you've been out there, you'll notice we kind of have a north-south burn line that splits the remnant portion of the prairie um, in an east and a west burn unit. And this is mainly because things like those bison skippers and other pollinators, other, other wildlife, um, they're going to be overwintering in that um, the standing vegetation. So if we burn off all of that prairie in one season, there's nowhere else in that in that area within you know 10 to 20 miles that uh, some of those pollinators can repopulate repop from. Um, and even if they could, you know, it's not likely that they're going to find this little 20 acre acre prairie in the Kansas City area. So it's really important to not burn off uh, and not do. Uh, large scale management on a site like this where you're going to be destructing, uh, you know, quite a bit of refuge habitat for these, these little animals. Um, so right there, you know, we're burning, it looks like the western half of the prairie um, up along the tree row there, the neighbor's property, and then we'll burn slightly over the hilltop. Uh, we've been burning every year on this prairie, part of the wet and part of the dry area. So we're not destroying all the, essentially the moist habitat in one season and then we're not taking all the dry habitat where critters can overwinter uh, in the other part of the season. So you kind of take part of the dry, part of the wet each season and hopefully, you know, the idea is that we're leaving the largest amount of refuge and then you're also creating, uh, you know, good, good flowering resources in those freshly burned units the following season. Um, other things like reptiles, you know, they utilize that uh, grass thatch from the year before because that's where the mice like to be. Uh, they have the tunnels underneath the grass. So, so leaving some refuge there is really important. Go ahead, Bruce. So this is just another picture of the prairie burn. Um, typically we have quite a few volunteers from the Kansas City area, uh, a few board members, myself, and then I usually bring up one or two uh, folks from the Joplin Master Naturalist group to help out. Um, there's a picture of the, the pre-COVID uh, volunteer burn crew. Um, so like I say, you know, six to eight people is more than enough for a 10 acre unit. Um, we're gonna start burning some larger units. So we may need some more people in the near future, but we're gonna be including those uh, prairie plantings, which uh, pretty much the whole site has been reconstructed at this point. We're gonna add some more seed this year. Uh, but for the most part, those, those sites will be kind of under the same uh, burn regime as the remnant where we're burning a portion of the uh, planting areas along with a portion of the remnant each year. Go ahead. Go ahead, Bruce. Oh, I did. This is oh, okay. a reconstruction. Oh, there we go. So this is uh, one of the reconstructions. Uh, this was, I believe, on the south. Uh, no, I'm thinking of it the wrong way. On the northeast corner of Snowball Hill. So um, closer to the houses across the road. Uh, this was actually the first year. So after planting, you can see the sawtooth sunflower. There's also some ragweed in there, but um, I don't know if that, the flowers on the left, exactly what those are, but you can see there's a lot, a lot of species in there other than just weeds. And that's in, in year one. So it's looking really good. And those plug plantings, what we try to do with that is add in uh, some of the things like the lead plant that Bruce was talking about. Uh, some of the more conservative plants that are um, either we don't get a lot of seed from, uh, the seed is expensive, we can't find local seed from it uh, in any type of quantity. So we, we collect seed off of that prairie, uh, especially from the conservative, more rare plants, and take them to greenhouses, have those grown into plugs. And then uh, I think at least two to three times now we've planted, you know, anywhere from 400 to about a thousand plugs at a time. So it really helps speed those uh, reconstructions up, get those flowering resources on the ground a lot quicker, um, and then also helps diversify those plantings for a, a much wider range of pollinators and uh, other wildlife. 
Go ahead. So with uh, Jared's work, besides protecting the 22 acres of the really high quality remnant prairie, but we're also um, adding about 50 acres uh, on a couple sides of that of a diverse prairie reconstruction. So as time goes on, we'll hopefully expand the, the seed base and expand the prairie habitat for um, for the wildlife in the area that will will benefit from having this prairie here. And so now I guess one of the benefits of having a Zoom tour is that we don't have to stay in just one location. So we can now um, for just a little bit visit a couple of our other prairies. Um, still not too far away, but ones that um, oh, it would probably take about an hour or so to drive there, but we can zoom right there uh, in almost no time at all. So um, just a little bit southwest of Sedalia in Pettis County, uh, the Prairie Foundation has um, two prairies. Friendly Prairie, uh, which was actually the very first uh, prairie acquired by the Missouri Prairie Foundation in 1969. Um, it's larger than Snowball Hill, but still not real large for prairie remnant. It's 40 acres. Um, and it's a, a prairie that's much more level in a uh, general landform, but it does have a small kind of wet swale at the north end of it. Um, it does have uh, a good diversity of native plants. At least 300 different kinds have been found there and several rare species, <clears throat> state listed rare species have been found there. <clears throat> so for just a little bit quicker tour of uh, Friendly Prairie, um, if you go there in the spring, you can find uh, many of the typical spring prairie flora, things like Indian paintbrush and uh, pacoon there in the middle and wood betony. So it does have, uh, you know, a lot of the typical prairie flora. Uh, there are some of the other animals present there too, including another prairie king snake we happen to find on one of our hikes, which is always, uh, at least for me, kind of a highlight of the day. And then as we get into late spring, it's got the pale purple cone flowers and the other characteristic species that you find. Um, and in this particular photo, besides the pale purple cone flowers, you can see a little bit of sensitive briar and the finger coreopsis. Now, um, Friendly Prairie does support a population of uh, Regal Fritillaries, which are a state listed species of conservation concern <clears throat> in Missouri and certainly one of the most prairie uh, dependent um, insects and, and butterflies we have. So um, it's uh, a very important um, site for, well, pretty much all the sites are now uh, because of the, the increasing rarity of the Regal Fritillaries. So having them there is, um, is very important. Now, besides the, the butterflies, uh, again, being a fairly small prairie, um, it's a little bit more limited habitat for grassland birds than some sites, but it does support uh, some good ones. Again, dick sissels and henslow sparrows and a number of um, good characteristic grassland birds are found there. And just a couple years ago, a real exciting discovery happened there. Uh, it was the first year <clears throat> when a very rare prairie insect was discovered in Missouri, including being found here at uh, Friendly Prairie and then also at Drover's Prairie where we're going to next. So this rattlesnake master boar moth, um, the adults lay their eggs near rattlesnake master. <clears throat> the larva will uh, find the rattlesnake master and bore into the <clears throat> bore into the roots or the, the lower part of the stem and that's where they develop until they're ready to emerge. Uh, apparently it doesn't actually kill the rattlesnake master, so it doesn't really hurt it, but they have to have rattlesnake master, which is one of those conservative or restricted uh, prairie plants. 
and uh, the rattlesnake. And generally speaking, this has to be in a native population, not just a planted population. Um, this insect is so rare that it <clears throat> has been considered for even federal listing as an endangered species. We don't know if it will be or not, but it is being considered for that. But uh, with the large number of sites that were found in Missouri uh, a couple years ago, that certainly may influence uh, whether or not this insect gets listed. So um, a rather remarkable discovery. Uh, so of the sites in Missouri where this rare moth has now been found, uh, one is Friendly Prairie and then Pr Drover's Prairie is another one. Uh, and then again in the fall, uh, you can find downy gentian there. And at least with my limited uh, travels through the prairies in the fall, probably the, the most abundant I've ever seen them was at Friendly Prairie. In portions of the prairie, uh, they were just sort of all over the place. Uh, Again, management is uh, extremely important to the, to the prairie. Um, Jared, did you want to mention a few things about? Yeah, I can. Um, so uh, one thing I wanted to touch on a little bit was the regal fritillary butterflies. We've been doing some surveys, MDC and myself, on uh, several of the prairies. Uh, the Sedalia area, kind of the Taborville, Wakanta area, and then kind of the western uh, Nevada to Joplin area. A um, lot of volunteers, a lot of MDC folks. Um, but for about three years now, we've been basically trying to develop some population estimates across these prairie areas. Um, that Sedalia area, Friendly Drovers, a couple of private prairies, a couple of MDC sites, has a really high number of regal fritillary butterflies. Um, and they're actually doing some mark recapture studies this year where uh, they can really, um, develop a lot of population data as far as, um, uh, you know, mating success, things like that. And then uh, one interesting thing, it was kind of always thought, or at least widely thought that uh, the regal fritillaries didn't really travel amongst different prairies. So with the highly fragmented landscape that we have now, uh, you know, it's kind of thought that those regals were stuck on this 40 acre site or stuck on drovers, which is 80 acres. Um, you know, and, and being a few miles apart that they didn't really travel. Uh, but interestingly, they, they did mark some last year and found that they were traveling between Friendly and Drovers and then another prairie on the other side of Highway 65. Um, so at least a few miles they are traveling. Uh, it's been thought that they didn't cross like wooded corridors or big rivers or uh, things like that. Uh, just they saw those as boundaries. Uh, they're crossing four lanes of Highway 65 there to get over to Friendly and Drovers from the MDC sites and um, private land. So, uh, so that's really encouraging um, that, you know, our continued work and continued acquisitions of scattered prairies uh, do benefit these uh, increasingly rare um, insects. Um, just this picture above, it's really important for us to keep um, a lot of our fence rows and uh, riparian corridors, things like that free of trees and brush that don't belong there. Um, there are, you know, shrubs and things like that that do belong on the prairie, but uh, linear brush along fences um, really don't serve a lot of purpose on the prairie. Um, and so we, we always try to eliminate those when we can. Go ahead, Bruce. Okay, and, um, and then also um, have kind of an interesting burn regime at, um, at Friendly Prairie where, um, as Jared mentioned before, with Snowball Hill, uh, we burn about half of it every year, but we burn it in kind of a continuing pattern of half of it uh, kind of going from like the north to the east to the south to the west um, and farming kind of a, an interesting pattern of recently burned and unburned uh, patches and, and that. So um, that's uh, one of the, the ways that we're uh, kind of uh, doing some of the, the management, the burns at, uh, at Friendly. And then um, moving on down to our next prairie, um, Drover's Prairie. Uh, this one was a 1981 acquisition. 
It's uh, 80 acres, so it's twice as big as Friendly Prairie, but it's actually in two 40-acre pieces that just corner. So the southwestern corner of one uh, joins the northeast corner of the other one. Um, and if you do go to visit, uh, they're both nice, but actually the southwestern portion, the southwestern 40 acres, seems to be <clears throat> kind of the most diverse, um, uh, especially floristically, of the, of the, two, of the two pieces. Um, it's located only about a mile south of Friendly Prairie. And so um, over time, uh, one of the interesting plants that we find there is a prairie hyacinth, a much rarer version of, um, where a much rarer relative of the wild hyacinth that's found throughout Missouri. Uh, this one used to be considered a species of conservation concern in Missouri. Since that time, enough populations have been found. It's not currently listed as a species of conservation concern. It seems a little more secure, but um, it's, still, <clears throat> it's still one of significance because it is still uh, a very uncommon species. <clears throat> Some of the other sort of characteristic um, flora on um, Drover's Prairie is things like the spider milkweed in the foreground, as well as the Coryopsis in the background. Uh, things like Prairie Rose, the Carolina Rose that's found here. <clears throat> And then an interesting discovery just a few years ago, and one of the things I think make it interesting to still come out and visit the prairies is new discoveries we still make. Something like this bunch flower, this big, white, showy uh, plant, and yet we didn't know it was there, even though this prairie has been protected since 1981. <clears throat> we didn't know this plant was on the prairie until only a couple years ago when we discovered it in the very southwestern corner. So even though these prairies have been protected for a long time, we're still making <clears throat> new discoveries out there of, of even, even some of the showier plants. Again, as we go through the summer, there's things like uh, the wild, the white wild indigo and the lead plant. Um, an interesting little orchid from that prairie and a number of other prairies is the ragged orchid. Uh, this is an orchid which <clears throat> is pretty inconspicuous out on the prairie. Uh, it's up to a couple of feet high, but the plant is green, the flowers are green, so um, it doesn't really stand out too much from the prairie grasses and that, but if you're lucky you get to spot one, and when you actually look close at it, the flowers are so remarkable and delicate, it's still to me just an awesome plant to find, um, even though it's not particularly colorful, um, it's still just, just an awesome little thing to discover out on the prairie. Once again, um, as Jared mentioned, the regal fritillary is found on Drover's Prairie. And then uh, again, it does support a number of our kind of typical grassland birds. Uh, in this case, a Henslow sparrow, which are ones that are, are found on Drover's Prairie and, and many of our other ones. Uh, sometimes you can catch a nice uh, sunset there on the prairie. And finally, ending the season and kind of ending our virtual tour in the fall with the willow leafed aster, one of the latest blooming wildflowers on the prairie. Uh, as you can see, the prairie grasses are all dried up by now, uh, but the willow leafed aster is still, um, still in bloom and adding a bit of color to the prairie landscape. Uh, Jared, did you have anything else to, to add? Yeah, I was just going to add, um, most of you probably notice these asters late in the year. The monarchs really love them as they're kind of making their big push south. Um, so they're kind of a really important uh, component of these prairies, um, not only for the pollinators, but also for other, um, you know, grassland birds and things like that that are kind of moving south with, with their food sources and things like that. So um, just a nice component of these prairies. 
And I just wanted to add that we do uh, also treat all of the acres on our prairie. So, you know, 3,500 acres or so. First Aresia multiple times in a season, other invasives uh, like here at Drovers. Um, we've got that wild uh, parsnip, uh, kind of looks like a, oh, kind of like a prairie parsley, but much taller. Uh, really invasive, especially up in that area along the roadsides has moved in some of the areas along uh, the edges of Drovers. So that's kind of a new one we're dealing with there. Uh, but, but keeping on top of those invasives and keeping the prescribed burns going, um, you know, kind of in order uh, is really important to the, to the maintenance and long-term health of these prairies. Yep, without that, um, uh, just simply buying the, buying the prairies, if we just set them aside and, and uh, Jared wasn't doing the management on them, uh, the sites wouldn't be protected at all. They just continue to degrade. So um, that's one of the things with prairies and our other native grasslands is that um, a certain amount of management activity is absolutely essential to protecting these treasures and, um, and to maintain them in a, a healthy state. And so I guess now if there's questions that um, we can try and answer. Sure, can you hear me? Yep. All right. Uh, thank you both for a wonderful presentation. Um, we do have a number of questions. Uh, here's the, the first one is from Val. When referencing very conservative species, I think this was at the beginning, Bruce, mm -hmm. uh, are the more conservative, more difficult to accommodate in the in backyard gardens, assuming they can be found for sale. Okay, um, I I think the idea is, uh, can you can you plant them? Can will they will they come up from seeds that you can reestablish in sites? And um, I think with at least a number of them, the answer is yes. Uh, I don't know. Some of them probably would be very difficult and uh, they may just need certain conditions in the soil and, and that. But there are uh, many of the conservative species that uh, can be acquired from the, the native plant nurseries uh, and can be established some pretty readily. Some others uh, do need to work harder on them like Jared mentioned um, uh, with the, the potted ones uh, in trying to get those started that need a little more help. Um, Jared, did you I have? Know, I know there's several uh, of the rare ones like the Michigan lily. You're going to have a hard time finding that to begin with. Uh, there's some genetics issues likely at play there as well where they're not producing good seed because there's two plants and um, the seed that they have doesn't get cross-pollinated. Uh, things like bunch flower, when we send that seed off, it's a two-year crop at the greenhouse before we get it back, and that gives us about a two-inch tall plant uh, with very little root. So uh, I think uh, Rex Hamilton had told me one time that uh, what they have planted takes them seven to eight years before they ever get a flowering plant. So uh, some of these things spend so much time investing in roots, um, and that's if you do get the seed to germinate. Uh, there's other things like orchids that require different fungi and things like that. So uh, like Bruce said, there are a number of them that are readily available, but then there's also a pretty good number that they are conservative for a reason. And that's, you know, a lot of those things we don't really know the details on. All right. Um, Steven said, I'm thinking about visiting Snowball Hill tomorrow for the very first time. How long are the trails and mode paths? So there's gonna be uh, one main mode path. Uh, it comes from the parking lot, goes up the hill, right along the property line, and then it cuts back towards the railroad tracks, uh, right at the, the end, edge of the remnant and the planting on the hilltop. And then it'll follow one of the terrace, the old uh, terraces, because a portion of that was cropped. It'll follow that terrace top around back to the original trail. Um, along the west boundary. So it kind of gives you a good, uh, really good view of the whole site. Once you're on top of the hill, you're right at the edge of the remnant. You can kind of look out through the remnant and see everything. And then you get a chance to walk through multiple stages of planting. So uh, the planting that you're going to walk through on that terrace is between one and three years old. So you get kind of a, a nice, uh, I guess, continuum of, of different stages of planting there. Um, I'm guessing length is 
half mile or less total. All right. Um, when uh, you showed you showed the planting at Snowball Hill that you were doing, uh, do you water your plugs all season? So uh, typically the plugs that we get, uh, I request those to be ready in the spring or in the fall. So we're planting those in like April uh, or September. So, you know, ideally they're getting rainfall right as we're planting them. Uh, and then at least for a while while they're establishing roots. Um, if I was to keep those plugs personally here at the house, uh, when you're growing those plugs, you have to water them at least once a day, sometimes more than, you know, right now you'd be watering them twice a day. Um, so that's why we kind of let the, the greenhouse native plant growers take charge of that. And then uh, we just, we buy the plugs and plant them in the spring or fall. All right. Oh, um, Stacy asked, how do you identify the prairie hyacinth versus the wild hyacinth? Uh, good question. Um, if I remember right off the top of my head, um, otherwise there are several books that can be consulted on it, like the floor of Missouri and that. Um, I, well, first of all, the prairie hyacinth blooms much later than than the typical wild hyacinth. The wild hyacinth is um, a fairly early spring bloomer and it is, I believe, totally done before the prairie hyacinth normally starts flowering. Um, so I'd have to look up the exact dates, but that's one good way to, to tell. Um, the prairie hyacinth gets to be a taller plant. Um, I think it gets a longer spike with more flowers on it but the flowers are a little more separated, not quite as closely bunched together as with the wild hyacinth. But um, the timing itself is, is very helpful because uh, I don't think there's really any overlap. There's the wild hyacinth in the spring and then uh, late spring, uh, early summer, uh, the prairie hyacinth. All right. Um, what species of cool season grasses or carex are found in these remnant prairie areas? Uh, there's a lot of them. <laughs> um, there's, um, well, there's cool season grasses, things like June grass and some of the others are uh, true prairie grasses, but they're cool season grasses. Um, and then when it comes to sedges, there's a long list of them. Uh, and I'm not um, a sedge expert myself by any stretch, but there are many different kinds of sedges. Now, one of the more restricted and characteristic prairie sedges is one called Carex bicknellii. And so that's one that is a, a pretty conservative species of sedge. Uh, so that's one of them. But um, like I say, there are a wide variety of sedges and I don't have the list to look up exactly right now, but um, probably 15 to 20 maybe just on Snowball Hill, something like that. Um, so there are many sedges. They are a, an important part of the, the prairie. And then there are some of the cool season grasses and that too. Okay, uh, Stephen asked, how do you grow your native seeds in plugs? I've been interested in starting a micro prairie in my backyard. So the, the plugs, a lot of those, um, you have to scarify the seed. So um, some folks do that like in sand, moist sand, putting in the freezer. You can look up a lot of different um, methods online. You can do, use ass, different forms of acids. Uh, you can also use warm water for scarification on certain seeds. Um, and then basically just getting small starter plots um, you know, something with a deep root, uh, so you can see my hands here, you know, here's, here's a, an ink pen, uh, you know, six inches or whatever, something that's tall, so that plant can establish a deep root, those prairie, prairie plants are going to be deep rooted. Uh, if you put them in your typical, you know, the annuals you'll get from Home Depot or wherever, uh, those are going to be a much shallower pot, they're not going to allow that plant to grow a deep tap root, um, so start them in that. Um, a lot of folks will just get them started in the fall, um, you know, November, 
Uh, let them go through the winter months. Uh, don't let them stay dry for very long through the winter months. And then kind of hope for the best the next spring. Um, if you're going to do it on your own, you can look online at different uh, native plant nurseries and things like that. And they'll, they'll have all the supplies that you need. But basically, you know, find a, a potting soil that you, you think is going to work and uh, put the seeds in there. Um, and, and like I said, there's not there's not a huge science behind it. You know, the native plant nurseries are really good at it. Uh, but I know a lot of private landowners, things like that, that grow their own plugs and they just keep them watered. Um, you don't want them getting a ton of sunshine uh, early on. So, uh, you know, some folks use shade cloth and things like that to keep them from getting that hot afternoon sun this time of year. Um, usually you need a full, full growing season though, before you plant those. So like if you start them in the fall, don't plant them till the following fall. Um, so, but, you know, other than, other than plugs, you can also just, you know, do your, do the proper prep of your site, uh, get rid of the vegetation, spray out any type of invasives or any existing vegetation, and then just kind of scatter that seed on bare soil in the winter months. And that works really well too. Okay. Um, Jared, can you talk a bit about the removal of trees on prairie lands that MPF owns? Yeah, so um, especially when we acquire new properties um, or properties that have um, changed hands, things like that, uh, some, some prairies are just more prone to becoming very woody uh, and covered in trees than others are. Um, but especially on new acquisitions, you know, those prairies were managed um, for other purposes than just for the wildlife and just for the sake of being a prairie. Um, you know, whether like Snowball Hill was hayed. Um, there's other prairies, some of these southern prairies, they're all hay prairies in the southwest part of the state. So uh, they kind of start haying around the wet areas or they'll hay around uh, some sort of rock outcropping and those kind of start growing into trees. Uh, fence rows, you know, blossom into trees. Um, those are really detrimental to the health of the prairie just because you're you're creating a seed source really close to that prairie and you're kind of surrounding that prairie with a lot of seed sources from these trees and, and undesirable shrubs. Um, historically, you know, these prairies, they weren't treed landscapes. There, there were some desirable shrubs in the wetter areas um, and kind of scattered shrub moths, but um, largely they were tree free. Um, and so we are trying to mimic that um, condition on our prairies today, even though they are fragmented we look at various uh, government land office notes, historical survey notes, and that kind of really helps us inform uh, what these prairies looked like 200 years ago. And that's what we try to try to mimic as close as we can. So uh, say a site like Carver Prairie down here in Newton County, south of Joplin, um, that was right on a historical woodland and prairie boundary. Um, and so in fact, it cuts right through the middle of the property. So we're going to really try to promote more savanna type situations in our reconstruction field back there. And so I've been kind of weeding around some oak sprouts uh, to where we're promoting those. We're not burning through those oak sprouts uh, and we can transition into our 50 acre woodland there from the open prairie. So it's kind of a nice continuum from prairie to savanna to open woodland. Uh, whereas like Snowball Hill, um, for instance, was one where we didn't have trees within several miles historically. So you know, you look around, if you're up on top of that hill, the closest trees would have been in the nearest creek. Um, and that that's a couple miles away. So, you know, our our desire to have trees there is going to be much less than on a prairie where it was close to a historical savanna situation. Um, and then also you look at the tree species, you know, things like hackberry and elm were never found in a prairie, um, whereas some of your oak species were. Um, so, you know, you kind of evaluate a lot of different things, but as far as the, you know, you look at what's supposed to be there. And then, like I said, the tree species matters as well. All right, thanks. Uh, Kathy asked, what are some important early season prairie flowers that provide nectar for pollinators when not much else is blooming? Um, probably, probably, a to a certain extent, almost any of the early prairie flowers do. Um, actually, interestingly, uh, one I remember somebody telling me about is actually a very small little shrub. Um, it's called prairie willow. 
and it is actually a type of willow, but um, it grows not uh, kind of along the water's edge, but it grows in upland prairies. Uh, it never gets very tall. It doesn't really grow into a tree. It just is all these very tiny, very small little sprouts that typically get burnt back to the ground every year or two. But it flowers very er it flowers real early in the spring, and I have heard from Missouri's bee expert that that is a, a very good source of nectar for a lot of the very early bees in that that come out. Um, so besides that, uh, that one's kind of notable. But other than that, I would say just pretty much any of the early ones. Uh, out on prairies, I mean, there's some of the little buttercups, um, violets, even spring beauties, um, pecoons, things like that. Uh, I'm sure some are better than others as far as pollinators, but you know, any of those um, early blooming spring wildflowers uh, presumably should be helpful to some of the pollinators. I see a lot on our prairies on the wood betony or lousewort um, and then also on the cream indigo. Um, a lot of bumblebees like those two uh, species in particular but um, I do see a lot of pollinators in the spring on those those plants. All right thanks. Uh, James asked to what extent have other insects been studied at the MPF prairies? Um, well, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of entomologists uh, that do work in Missouri or on Missouri prairies. Uh, we have benefited in the past from some work that has been done on butterflies uh, by a few individuals and, and groups like the Idalia Society I mentioned. Um, we have gotten some work done in the past on some of our bees uh, by contract contracts with um, Mike Arduzer. Uh, we had a study done on dragonflies a few years, <clears throat> a few years ago. Um, so, uh, well, and then on bio blitzes, um, Dr. James Traeger is, has looked at ants on a number of our prairies, but fortunately there's not too many <clears throat> entomologists that, um, that are working on our prairies. Uh, this year, we're fortunate to have a volunteer uh, looking at leaf beetles on a couple of our prairies and hopefully in future years <clears throat> at other prairies too. So um, we kind of take the advantage, we try and take advantage of whenever we have somebody uh, that can do it, but um, entomologists at that level are unfortunately kind of few and far between um, capable of doing the, the identifications on, um, on major groups of insects. All right, uh, James Traeger had a comment here. At Shaw Nature Reserve, nice populations of Veratrum virginicum, which I think is a Virginia bunch flower, um, yeah. mm -hmm. have, have been established from seed. Indeed, they take several years to be seen flowering, but now some of the offspring of original sowings are expanded, have expanded the population. Just a good. Uh, yeah. um, I did just look up the hyacinths, and uh, according to the Flora Missouri, uh, the prairie hyacinth, you can tell one thing is it generally has more flowers, like 50 to 100 flowers, where the more common wild hyacinth usually has under 50 flowers on the stalk. And as far as flowering, and of course this is a statewide gradation, but the, um, the wild hyacinth is typically blooming in from early April to uh, like early to mid-May. And the prairie hyacinth is usually blooming from uh, earlier mid-May until about the end of June. So um, you can see there's generally a pretty great difference between when you'll, when you'll see them in flower. All right. I have, a, I think it looks like one more comment and one more question. Comment is from Kathy. It says, hi, I'm Kathy from Southern Illinois and volunteer at Crab Orchard National, National Wildlife Refuge's Prairie and Pollinator Gardens. I was able to start gray-headed coneflower from seeds I gathered last fall. I seeded them in my garden and they came up beautifully. I'm sure that was um, directed towards that last question about um, uh, uh, growing native seeds 
and plugs and things like that. Thanks, Kathy. Um, one more question I've got from Stephanie. Do you have uh, nut grass, the sedge? How do you eliminate it? <laughs> uh, let's see. Nut grass, I think that's um, actually a type of sedge, I believe, and I think it's the genus Cyperus. And I can try and look here pretty quick, but I think that's what that's referring to. And if that's the case, um, it's not something that we try to eliminate. I don't believe there's any of the, any of that genus that are not native. Um, um, so there are a number of species some of the species are actually, I think, pretty conservative. So they would be pretty much restricted to a good prairie. Um, and some others are uh, not conservative. So they are very, uh, you know, pretty widely distributed through the, through the landscape. But, um, but none of them that I have heard of in a natural setting uh, are a problem at all, or something that would be invasive and actually, um, you know, spread or be detrimental to, to having them in, um, in a native prairie at all. Yeah, like Bruce said, we don't, we don't really worry about any of those on the prairies. If it's something in your yard or a garden at your house, there's a chemical called halo sulfuron, H-A-L-O sulfuron. Um, it's that's the actual chemical name. I'm not sure what the trade name is, but that's one that they use. Uh, I don't think it kills most of the turf grasses, but it does kill some of those sedges that, you know, would grow up. I mean, I have them in my garden. I've got a blackberry patch and a little strawberry patch. And after a rain, I just am out there pulling these sedges out. Um, and so, you know, in the prairie, they belong in your strawberry patch, maybe not so much. So uh, you might look into that one chemical if that's if that's the case all right i think that's all the questions um thank you so much bruce and jared for a great presentation um just to everyone else um we have uh three more webinars this week next week we'll be hearing um from jared again another happy hour on the prairie he's going to be talking about uh carver prairie noah brown prairie and la petite gem um, and then uh, the following week on the 22nd, uh, Margo Farnsworth will be uh, interviewed by Carol David. They're going to talk about her new book. And the following week on the 29th, Alan Granhagen will be interviewed by Carol David about his new book. So um, please be sure to sign up for these next webinars. And um, thank you very much. Uh, it was a great presentation. Have a great Wednesday. See you all next week. Bye.